think, when I've been asked this um, a lot, especially with Japan. Yeah, especially I, I just came back from Japan and I've been living there for about three years. And people always ask me, you know, where are you from? Or, you know, what are you? And I, I do say that I'm British. And then people always look at me blankly and they say, you know, it's quite a difficult concept for them. And they're like, okay, so are you half? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm Indian, that's why I'm brown. Um, but I'm from, I'm from Britain. Um, I think when I went to India, I felt like, oh yeah, similar to, to what you were saying. I just thought like, yeah, I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna speak in Gujarati, it's gonna be fine. Um, and I remember going shopping in Mumbai, and everybody was like to me, just don't talk. <laughs> but like, if you talk, they're gonna know that you're not from here and they're gonna rip you off. Mm. They're like, whatever you do, let, you know, Shilagaki or whatever, talk. And then I started realizing how I thought that I'd just sort of just like pop in there and fit right in, and it's not the case. It wasn't the case at all. Um, I feel a strong Indian presence because of what, of the way that we've been brought up. And when I think of being Indian, it's because of the ancient ideas and a lot of it is deep rooted with religion and spirituality that has been instilled in me. But if I try and equate that to what India is right now, or, or if, if I went there and said, hey, I'm from here, it's, it's not the same thing. Like, I feel like the things that I've been taught are from way, way back, that have been passed on from our ancestors over and over, but maybe it's not exactly the same as, as what's going on right now. Um, in terms of an uh, East African identity, um, I only, I don't personally see that right now because I feel like I, I don't know a lot about it. I know about the stories that my grandfather tells and I feel it a lot with my father and I'd, I'd like him to, to share that with me. Um, and my mother too. Um, but in terms of me, I would say yeah, that I'm British, but and the ideas of me being Indian are from where I've been taught. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in um, I, I see myself as British um, now, but that it's shifted a lot over the years. Um, I think in my um, um, teens and twenties, um, I, I think the whole idea of identity and what it means to be Indian is also kind of somewhat kind of influenced by what else is happening in culturally in the media and society at the time, and and what your peers, how your peers also present themselves as well. And um, um, I, I think um, growing up, I probably would say that I was Indian. Uh, more and that that carried on um, and then and then it kind of there was like all these kind of new terms of Anglo Indian Anglo Asian British Asian um, and I, I certainly would like identify myself as uh, as British Asian for quite a long time and then I reverted back to Indian kind of in my thirties and now I I just say British because I don't like this whole idea of us being. Um, people segregating themselves and I don't like the idea of categorisation whether that's in like terms of like race um, or um, um, and, and religion and, and class, well more so class I would definitely say I'm working class British um, and yeah um, I, these days, I gotta call myself British more from just from experiences like such as yourselves. Like when you go to India, um, you certainly you you're not seen as you're you're Indian. You're you're seen as a foreigner, mm -hmm. and they will say NRI or foreigner, um, and that's how you're seen. And also in terms of like. Um, how you're seen, like to me, the last time I went to India was a year ago, and you're you're basically seen as a cash cow walking down the street, and they're like out to fleece you um, and get you to buy X Y Z, rather than seeing oh this is some this is one of us, this is one of our people that happens to live abroad, like that you're you're the outsider, and more recently the kind of I, I um, you know things to do with like um, property and land. Uh, um, and it's happening a lot um, in in our communities that you know our generations, parents, 
who have moved away and they're getting older and they're dying and it's like who does all of this <laughs> acres of land belong to it's like oh well not to you because you left it you went abroad and not to your children because they weren't born here and they know they haven't got a clue about farming so that whole thing of belonging and kind of being rejected from your by by your kind of immediate family uh, to your own house and your own village and your land certainly kind of makes you feel for me makes me feel even more british because you, there's there's an element of kind of rejection i think um and and inclusion um and also about the way men perceive you when you're there and i think i've, I've been, been becoming more and more feminist with age and I don't like being uh, talked to in a, in a condescending, uh, demeaning manner and I don't like to be touched up like any of us don't like that. And the way that you're expected to behave as well in India? Well, like as of, all of that, yeah, like dress and, you know, I, I, I don't dress like yourself, I don't, definitely don't wear vests when I'm there, but I think the last time I went, um, I deliberately, like, um, um, and, the, and the time before when I went 2008 um, uh, you know I'm not going to pack kameezes or Punjabi suits and I'm, I would wear them here um, but I'm not going to wear them over there because no matter what you wear you're still going to be treated as a, as a foreigner and I'm not going to pretend to be Indian by wearing a sarva kameez when I go shopping because I'm still going to get fleeced and treated like whatever as a foreigner anyway so I'm just going to go as I am which is what I did and I think in some cases you might it, you're better off wearing Indian clothes when you're there um, but they can see it in the way you walk and exactly, um, right. your hair just the way you carry yourself the way and even and actually even like even though we might be some of us here might be size eight or size six we still look bigger uh, compared to them <laughs> and our body shape you know yeah. We our, our frames are not like like theirs. They can spot it, by the way. But um, uh, I always feel like every time I've been abroad, like just, just to India, when I reach Heathrow, I breathe a sigh of relief and like thank God, like I can like um, you know go to the toilet and expect it not to be like complete disgusting or like drink a glass of water and not have, have to fear or have like anything yeah. and like not have that anxiety of like. Be having gone back with a stomach bug, and that, and I kind of like I hate that in a way that like why, why do I have to like why am I so conditioned to like have to need like a hotel toilet to like just feel calm or like to have like a good shower, but yeah I feel like that side of relief that you talked about is like the the key indicator yeah, to what is home to you like where at what point do you breathe that side of relief is it when you touch down in India or when you come back and I think. That is like when you get the the nail on the head. Like, just, like, like when you have the shower in your own home, like when yeah, you feel with your. But you, yeah. I have the reverse as well. Like when every time I'm going, and I've like I've been I've been say, I think probably been the same many times. And in my twenties, I went every other year um, to India, and that, there's a, there's a sense of excitement when you're packing your suitcase, you're getting your insect cream ready, you're taking your <laughs> malaria. You know what I mean? You're you, you're ready, and you go, oh yeah, I'm going home. Like I'm gonna be with my family and this that and like after like two two days of being there and you think oh, but I haven't this yeah. <laughs> like, I can't you know that's what I feel like I never like my my friend Nabisa she her family's from um, she's Muslim from East India from Calcutta and like she says yeah I'm gonna go back home over the summer she's from she's from Wembley but she calls it back oh, home okay. I, that's interesting mm -hmm. to me but like even what you were saying about like malaria tablets and insect repellent i just feel like such a pathetic mm -hmm. indian like am i this am i really out here getting jabs like washing everything and having needing to, to make sure that over there they boil everything to death so that it doesn't have like any but you bugs just, like, I feel like, that even our bodies exactly, are like bodies evolved are... in a way where we can't whereas my mum can um crush I don't know if it's from Kenya, she's born in Kenya and lived there, but she went to India as well. Like she can stomach anything. And my dad as well. They can take the heat, they can stomach the food. And Look, this is us just struggling. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, being a bit of a lightweight. How, but, do, they, how yeah. do they manage, like, the. Because um, 
<coughs> I mean, I'm not assuming that we're all in the same class or caste because mm -hmm. we're very different and come from very different families, mm -hmm. despite what other people might perceive us all in this room. Um, but how did you negotiate the difference in privilege from mm -hmm. visiting India from London, from the UK, and the privilege that you have in this country um, and the privilege that you have in India? How, how was that? Um, it's, it's interesting how you like you kind of like you refer to as madam over there, and actually the, the, the more recently, and this is not a privilege, but um, um, being called auntie, you know, and it's like horrified, like auntie, auntie G, like and you're like, like, <laughs> like, but for them that's you know, but um, but so then, 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 if, then, if they say madam and stuff, just. Also, like I hate to bring it back to this, but like maybe it is also to get tips or yeah. to suck up. A but little it's, bit. Kind of it's a little bit. It's quite respectful, isn't it? I mean, not. Yeah. I mean, I think it is more maybe a respectful thing. I think because everybody does it. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know if I'm just. Saying and it's it. kind of left over. I don't know if they're calling you ma. ma no, I mean, there's in the the term madam is mom, used or mom. mom is used. It's used a bit more commonly. I think on on like you know toilets. Do they have like no? Which I think do they have what do they write ladies and rather than women? You know, women and, and gent, women and men. They write ladies and gents, and it just seems to be like an old legacy of. Um, maybe from like British kind of ways of addressing um, people. I think with the man, man thing, that, that yeah. sounds like it's probably... Sounds like yeah. it, but I don't, know, I don't know if they do that to you because you're from abroad, or if they do that, or they would treat, would say that to another Indian person, mom as well. But um, I, I definitely, I know, I know what you mean, you're kind of, you're made to feel a bit more important, like you're special, um, because you've come from abroad and you you look different, you present yourself differently. But to me, I kind of I kind of felt that there was this, there was there was a bit it was disappearing as well. And maybe it's just my perception. I hadn't been there long enough to kind of know. But it, it I, I kind of got got the impression there's a bit of animosity towards foreigner as well. Did you like, feel that animosity uh, more strongly because you're uh, British and uh, with with Asian heritage rather than American or yeah I don't, I don't know I mean as opposed to somebody who's white and, and visiting oh uh, yeah I don't, I don't. I couldn't say really, like whether there was an animosity. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if there's a difference between if the if they if there's a difference between someone British Indian going over or, or someone can Canadian Indian going over or American or Australian, you know, diaspora um, from those diasporas like go, going. Back. I, do, I do think that there is a difference with if if there was a white person, white British oh, yeah, person, white person and then a yeah. brown, like an Indian yeah, British yeah, person going fine. back. I feel like they do they they respect them in a yeah. way that's like they're coming here and they respect my culture and they're they're coming here to like learn. Like they think that that's how how white people come to their country. And they, I get the feeling that when we go there, they think themselves they think that they're better than us like they think they're just like coming back and like it's mm. I d yeah I do think there is a difference they don't they definitely don't see us as the white as they do with the white mm. British or American people mm. Mm. Um, I think they find it funny sometimes like if, if I'm trying to speak to them in my language they kind of like find it funny like oh look at her like <laughs> trying <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I do definitely think it's interesting, and 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 it is different. One of the things in terms of privilege, though, that I have seen, I do think that this is also tied up with money, and money is a big feature about how they see us and what the, we can give them mm -hmm. in terms of money. Um, is that when I've been to temples and stuff, or like pilgrimages there, the way that if they found out that we were British. That like we kind of get a shortcut in, yeah. And mm -hmm. but similarly, we're expected to kind of leave like a little bit of a thank you, thank you mm -hmm. to like the 
priest or whoever who is let us in, which which disgusted me. I kind of thought, as in what happened was, was that we were, it was a big, long pilgrimage, it was a hike through the foothills of the Himalayas. We were in like our walking boots and had protein balls yeah. and water and all of that kind of stuff. And now, obviously, people of all ages, old ladies and stuff, walking with like, part, like packages on their heads, barefoot mm. and stuff, climbing up this mountain as well. And I obviously felt like a bit of a mug, but also I, I yeah, didn't have yeah. the stamina. So then everyone obviously got up there. And firstly, people were shocked that we were British and we were actually walking. There's a helicopter service yeah. that they would expect us. Was it that the people that you went to? Gedanat. Okay. Yeah. Um, they kind of, they, they were like, oh, okay. Like, they, they quite like that. They were happy that, oh, you're British and you're actually walking, even though you can afford to do something, can afford to, to like, get people to carry you or mm. take a, a helicopter. So that, that were, they were happy about that. But then to actually enter the temple, there was a long line. And people, and the priest was like, oh, you guys can come with us to the front. And I was like, these people have also trekked up the yeah, entire day. Yeah to come up this mountain like I felt awful for having that privilege I was like I don't deserve this like my my faith is no it definitely no higher than any of these people and um yeah and I I, I felt that privilege in that way which made me rethink caste and privilege that I that I inhabit and what I benefit from inadvertently which I want to try and distance myself from, even though it's difficult. I know in this country, in terms of privilege, I have led a much more privileged life than my parents have. And I do owe it to them and to my grandparents for having built those strong foundations, for having made those sacrifices, not necessarily following their dreams, but having stable jobs that will just earn them money instead of doing something artsy or creative that wouldn't have necessarily given them as much stability. And I know by them having done that and sac made those sacrifices, I have the privilege of choice, which is going to university. And my parents both went to university um, to do, do accounting and property. Um, but I have the choice of trying to do something a little bit more um, liberal. And I, I have, the, I'm grateful for the privilege of the time and space that I have to think about my passions and what interests me, how politically inclined, which I know that they didn't have a chance to do. Um, would you say that the main aim was to survive? Yeah, I would. Um, I know for a fact that my grandparents' main aim was to survive. And it's, it's funny because I know that for them and for my parents, what keeps them going is their children and creating a better life for their children. I don't have any kids, but... I, and I don't know if this is me being like naive and selfish, but I can't imagine like trying to shift my entire life and put all my dreams to the side just because I want my kids to be all right. Like, <laughs> do you think that's because we've been because like in our grandparents' generation they came and they had to survive. They were thrown into this and yeah. they had nothing. They had to survive. And in our parents' generation, because of they were uprooted too, and our grandparents sacrificed so much, they often went without. So they had to like put everything aside and they needed to make money and stable or stable assets so that we would be okay. But we, because of our parents' hard work and our grandparents' hard work, we don't know what it feels like to be without in that way. Mm. So and I think we don't know what it feels like to have to like give everything up. I mean, because we don't know that survival. We don't have that. Yeah, we don't. we don't. We don't that have that have. Like, actually raw yeah. survival thing. And I think that our parents... Definitely. I think our parents felt like they owed it to our grandparents a lot more, mm -hmm. whereas we're like one more generation removed where we don't feel like we owe them in the same way. And do you, um, in comparison to how they lived, um, including their, their time in Uganda and their, their time in London, um, do you, would you, um, in comparison, do you think do you consider yourselves to be sort of surviving or do you see yourselves to be thriving now? I'd say that I'm thriving. I'd say that they yeah. are too. I, compared to the way that they lived and the sacrifices they made. And also, especially in our parents' generation, of that feeling of, I don't want my kids to go without because they actually went without 
And because they made those sacrifices, maybe I don't know what it feels like to go without. So yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I do think that I am surviving in certain political ways that they didn't necessarily have to. I think I'm having to think about things in a more critical way, whereas for them, I think it was, they were surviving, which meant that they weren't as, yeah, I, I, I don't know the point I'm trying to get at, but I think in some ways I am thriving in terms of how comfortable I am, the choices I'm able to make, but in some ways I am surviving in terms of having to rethink my identity in ways that they might not have and how somebody who um, the default white male cis English, um, do you consider, you know, and, and, and let's say this mythical hypothetical person is, you know, stable, owns property and uh, etc. Not that mythical. So, no, <laughs> very real. Yeah. But in comparison to that archetype, are you surviving or thriving? How much privilege do you have in comparison to that? Yeah, I do think in terms of that, I am surviving. I think I am having to constantly think. In terms of that, I am having to survive. Can I ask, because you describe yourself as a working class artist, mm -hmm. right? So I'm really curious about this because you've spoken a lot about how your, uh, how your mother made money when you were growing mm -hmm. up and, and your practice now, um, being an artist and being based in London as well. So. I think um, in some ways I, I'm, I'm thriving, you know, I've got, I've, I've worked constantly um, as an artist since late 90s and I've, I feel like I've done well in some respects, but in other respects, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just about, I'm just about surviving um, and it is an absolute struggle, um, but that's because of the choices I've made. Um, um, to to work um, as a visual artist and um, and to pursue that and not kind of bail out to getting um, a full time job and that's come close to that so many times because I'm I'm I've been really struggling um, financially and um, still continue to struggle but um, so in 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 some ways. Um, um, some of it's it's different. It's not it's not the same at all. But like some some of the experiences that I can remember, like from Birmingham early days, how they lived, um, um, I, I can still relate to that now. You know, like I'm I'm in my mid forties, but I still rent, and unfortunately, I still have to put up with like random people that I have to live in a flat share with. Mm -hmm. You know, and that just makes me feel like really sick. And I, I sorry, but I kind of like wonder like where, uh, you know, when I compare myself to like other um, Asian, um, British Asians from the same generation who um, didn't do art, they did something else. And they own their own house in um, the suburbs of London, uh, big five bedroomed buildings, children which I don't have um, and all of that and, and all that makes me feel very uncomfortable um, and, and, and culturally I do I do worry about my future um, because in our in all of our cultures here like that whole idea of having children and those children will support you in your old age I'm really worried about that because I, I, I now I've got to an age where I don't think I'm going to have children um, I possibly could but I don't know I don't even know if I want to and that whole thing of giving up your studio time giving up your artistic practice to have a family um, I know lots and lots of artists do it's a whole different area and of course like they make it work um, I don't want to do that but I do worry like long term like um, what am I going to do you know, I, I've worked, I've been self-employed, I've been a freelancer, I don't have that, that whole pension thing behind me, I don't have children, I don't have my own house. Um, but at the same time, I was talking to Alia earlier, that whole idea of taking risks in your life and whether you have that whole structural security that a lot of our, our, our Asian, in our Asian culture that we strive for, you know, we set mm -hmm. up that security. That we know that from our own histories that that can disappear overnight. So the way I kind of like see it is that well, um, 
Um, and, and also because my, my dad died and he was one of the secure-minded people that had the life insurance, pension, everything put in place and didn't live, didn't live beyond, like, didn't even reach for retirement age, so missed out on the whole kind of savings, which I guess I'm benefiting from now, which is keeping me going as an artist. So that's that sacrifice that my dad's made to me. Well, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of living off the, what my parents kind of worked really hard for. But um, I think I'm going off the plot a bit, but so I, I don't, compared to like the white male, um, and, and also Asians, whoever who has kind of um, um, sorted, in, in inverted commas, themselves out, like in their 20s and had that life plan that I'm going to go into dentistry because I know that I'm going to uh, earn an income. I just, didn't, I just didn't think that when I was younger. And I think, um, and, and, and for that, I'm struggling and I, I thought, like, in my 30s, like, oh, yeah, by 45, of course you'll be, like, sh um, showing in big shows and stuff. But I'm not. And I think that's the reality for not just, not because I'm, I'm Asian. I think that's the reality for um, artists, whether you're from whatever background you're from. But I think that in terms of like getting residencies and getting those big shows, maybe you don't get them because your surname's Patel. I don't know, and because you're female, mm -hmm. and because I don't make work about race, whereas I notice the artists who are um, not white and they're making work about race um, seem to um, get themselves on higher platforms um, rather than an artist who is just um, making work not to do with any kind of politics. It's a whole different area, I know, mm -hmm. but I think, it, I think it's all really all linked in. I think I think we were talking about uh, whether um, um, the idea of right risk is something that psychologically has taken place because our parents have had to kind of like risk, and also it could be related to death as well. Like um, that, you know, my my father passed away when I was twenty nine, um, also um, from cancer, and 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 from that from that kind of experience. Um, um, you you realise that life is short, and you think, oh, what the hell? I'm I'm just going to do X Y Z because I don't know how how much longer I'm here on this planet. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know I don't know if it's like an attitude that comes from like the Kenya side of the family because they certainly were um, just a lot more. And I noticed this in like other families also from like East Africa. They're they're less reserved than people from from in, like that. That haven't haven't done that route. They've come directly from India. Um, they're definitely, you know, like they're definitely a lot more outward and a lot more bolshy. I mean, I, I remember. Um, I don't know if it was like racist or what it was, but in Birmingham, someone this is when in the late seventies, someone kept firing at our back, my grandma's window, with an air pistol, with an air rifle, air rifle. And then um, my uncle's like, right, I've had enough of this. Right, got out, got out from his chair, went outside. I'm like, but you're gonna get shot with an air rifle. And uh, he goes, I don't care. And like, went out and he goes, he goes, oi! And it's dark, pitch dark, and like stood on some bin at the end of the fence and started shouting at whoever it was. He goes, I know you're there. And he goes, come out, come out, show you, show who you are. Right, and um, I was just like, absolutely hot. But maybe, maybe you don't care, maybe you, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and my grandma, even my grandma was just. I remember, like little kids were. You know, they're not. They're not racist. Not being horrible, but they were. Um, um, yeah, they're not friendly either. Like someone had a mirror and they kept uh, catching the sun and shining it in our face when we went past. And um, grandma was just like, yeah, you know, just like glared up, and then like. <laughs> but it's kind of being. I think. I'm, I'm, I kind of wonder if like the East African people that came from East Africa are just a lot more tougher, mm. more hardy, and they would just kind of like hit back if they had to, whereas like the Indians are a bit like, oh, no, no, we have to behave ourselves and like do what's right. 
Um, I think there's grateful. definitely like be grateful, be humble, and like I think the East Africans were just like, no, no I'm not putting up with this. Like, mm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And like, yeah, I think of like um, I was reading about Gronwick, um, the um, you know about Gronwick, the um, disputes, and I think they they were mostly East African. Yeah. Um, older ladies and I think maybe because they've been through that they go no we're, we're not we're happy to take on like the crappy job and like work long hours but we're not going to be treated with disrespect mm -hmm. and I don't know if like if you've been abused or somehow you you kind of you don't you don't put up with it mm -hmm. you think no I've got maybe it's this kind of idea of like nothing to lose so nothing to lose so I might as well just go mm -hmm. go for it do it I, but I, I don't know there's there's you know, there's no one, I don't know if anyone's made a sociological, Stunning. psychological <laughs> survey on this, yeah. but that's the impression yeah. I get. Um, one of the things that, sorry, I didn't realise yeah, no, I no. interrupted you No, before, no, 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 don't worry. But I just want to say, like, there's a really quick response to you opening up about, like, the things that you have sacrificed and going against the grain. As someone from the next generation, knowing that there's an artist like you that yeah. exists, who has gone against the grain and made those sacrifices and has decided that even though my peers are going into dentistry or pharmacy or whatever and I'm choosing to struggle through as an artist no matter how many obstacles that come my way and like no matter how many times I question that and to carry on like that actually means so much as someone who is younger who is also going through something similar